Deathbringer here. Subscribe so you never miss an upload. This video is brought to you by Elven Tower Adventures. They're close to releasing their 700th adventure and their art library contains just as many maps. You can support Elven Tower's creations directly through their Patreon page and gain access to everything they've ever created for as low as $1. Or by purchasing their hundreds of products on DriveThruRPG, DM's Guild, and Roll20 Marketplace. And their Foundry VTT library encompasses over 30 modules with hundreds of maps and adventures you can use to destroy your characters. He means entertain your players. And Elven Tower's crew now focuses on OSR content and produces adventures for Shadow Dark RPG. Links below. Welcome to Dungeon Craft. I'm Professor Dungeon Master, and this channel is about all things role-playing games. And reviews are now trickling in about the new D&D VTT. Now, granted, this is just playtest. This is like pre-beta, but we are getting some information here, and I thought I'd synthesize it into one quick video. I've watched videos from Ted at Nerd Immersion. He gets into an in-depth video over the course of 35 minutes or so. We got Dungeons and Discourse weighed in, and Steven Glicker from Roll for Combat. Uh, that show goes really into depth and it goes for about two hours or so. And they've got Derek Melinda as a guest. And other people, other patrons and viewers of the channel have let me know what's going on with this VTT test. So I thought I'd share the information. The reviews are ranging from not good to really bad. The best review I could find described it as not disappointing. I couldn't find anyone who said it was good, and I tried. I wanted to be fair. All of the people that have playtested have signed NDAs, but most of the information that I'm going to be talking about is just public information that everybody knew from the very first playtest. It's the same scenario we saw in the trailer where the D&D designers play and kobolds attack a tavern and an onkeg attacks, and uh, there's really nothing new with this scenario, but we are starting to find out how the game actually plays. So here's the good. Ted points out you can import a character and miniatures, which is awesome, and it's got 3D miniatures, 3D landscapes, animated spell effects. It essentially looks like an interactive video game. Now, here's the bad. Ted points out there's no death animations, except I think for that Ankeg I mentioned. Roll for Combat says there are no grids, and according to the polls on that show, grids are apparently something people want that they don't have. I don't get grids myself. I, I don't understand why they're necessary. I prefer zone combat myself, because it's a lot faster, but whatever. People want grids, and Steven Glicker points out there are no drawing tools, which he considers essential for game mastery on a virtual tabletop. The thing is, this looks pretty much like an interactive video game, and I watched Ted's video on Nerd Immersion on the way home from work with my wife, and we watched it together, and at the end of the video, I asked, are you interested in playing this? And she said, no, it looks like a video game. My players are just a small segment of the population, but I asked all of them, and they gave the same response. No, it's a video game, and I don't like video games. And that kind of tracks with my recent poll results. I put up the poll, uh, are you excited about the upcoming D&D VTT? And out of 7,000 votes at the time of this taping of this video, only 3% said, yes, I can't wait. Uh, meh, I'm going to wait and see, has 26%. No, I like playing at a table with real minis, 44%. And no, I play Theater of the Mind, 27%. And that pretty much mirrored the Dungeon Craft Patreon poll, where only 2% were excited about the VTT, and 64% preferred uh, humans with real terrain, and 19% said Theater of the Mind forever. Derek Melinda on Roll for Combat made a very insightful comment, in my opinion. He asked, what are they trying to emulate? Is it a digital Dwarven Forge where they're trying to recreate uh, the dungeon on a dining room table, or are they trying to emulate a video game? Because they're two very different things. If we have a Dwarven Forge table, and I say, well, you kill the goblins, you just remove the goblins. There's no mood lighting, there's no point of view, there's no fog of war. And there are no death animations, but if you play a video game, you kind of expect death animations, and one of the deaths of the monsters was animated, but the rest weren't. You're animating spell effects, but you're not animating sword effects. And those kind of expectations, that tug of war, 
that's something that the developers are going to have to make their mind up on because if you're going to animate every different type of monster death in a different way, that's going to take hundreds of developer hours. And what exactly is the audience looking for? Because if you want a video game, you already have Baldur's Gate 3. And if you want a tabletop, well, then people should be satisfied with you just saying, okay, I'm just going to X out that goblin and it's going to disappear. But somehow to me, and I don't even like tabletops, to me that feels unsatisfying. The advantage of physical terrain or virtual terrain is it prevents arguments. You could see line of sight. You could see who has cover. You can clearly see who is in range and who is not. The disadvantage of VTTs and physical terrain is once you get into grid thinking, the game really slows down. Game masters are not just thinking of the plot of the story. They are now thinking about how to manipulate the maps to set them up for the game, making twice as much work for themselves. This is what I call the Dwarven Forge dilemma. So early on, way back in the 90s, I was really into Dwarven Forge. I was like in on the ground level. I got tons of sets and we put them all out on my dining room table and it was super cool for a while. Then I discovered I was spending more time setting up my miniatures and the models than working on the adventures. And to be honest with you, the adventures suffered. That's how I developed ultimate dungeon terrain, zone terrain without walls. You just plop some minis and scatter terrain into the center and take it down in a matter of seconds. And it's a hours of setup time and it's easily transportable. This is a scene from my Lost City campaign coming in a couple of weeks. Over the course of two decades, I learned you don't need 3D terrain unless combat is going to occur. For role playing, you could just use theater of the mind. When you're using physical terrain, you're telegraphing to your players what is going to happen next. For example, if my players come over and they see a tavern set up on my table, they know there's not just going to be a conversation in the tavern. There is going to be a combat in the tavern. Otherwise, why would I build it? In theater of the mind, when players walk into the tavern, they don't know what's going to happen. Maybe it's going to be a conversation. Maybe they're going to meet a, a contact. Maybe it's going to be a barroom brawl or an assassination attempt on one of the player characters, or the floor could collapse. But if you're using any kind of terrain, whether it's virtual or physical, you know something is going to happen in the tavern. You're not going to be really surprised. Look, I get the strengths of virtual tabletops. You can play with your friends over long distances. It also does the crunchy math for you, enabling you to play high-level games. That's one of the things that slows down high-level play is there's a lot of math involved and the computer can take care of that for you. But on the other hand, I think that the actual story of the game that you are playing is a lot more important than the terrain. And by all accounts, there's very little holding that story together in the sample dungeon. Ted points out there are kobolds in a temple roasting a human on a spit, but there's really no reason to go to the temple to investigate it. Clearly, at least in the playtest, Wizards of the Coast seems to be paying more attention to the digital environment than the story, and I think that's a trap. Now, whenever I talk about story elements, the old grognards start freaking out, talking about, ah, story gamers messing up the game. I'm not sure when story became a pejorative in this hobby, and I myself have made fun of people who come to the table with an eight-page background where they're character is some sort of demigod or lost prince or whatever. But at the same time, the reason my players keep returning to the, the game every week or every month whenever we play is because of story. It's not the mechanics of the game. If the story isn't first in Paramount, I think you still might have an audience, but it's going to be a very different sort of audience, and it's going to be a very different, very limited sort of game. Now, one of the other responses, and this was pretty common in my polls, people said, well, I'm just going to keep playing on Fantasy Grounds or Owlbear Rodeo or Roll20 or, or whatever, and I'm not going to worry about it. But I, I don't know why you think that Wizards of the Coast is going to let you play the next iteration of Dungeons and Dragons on some other sort of platform. You could still play 5e on those things, but if you want the updated 5e with all the bells and whistles and the new spells and rules changes and updates, you're going to have to go to their virtual tabletop, which will only be accessible through D&D Beyond. I'm not saying it's going to happen right away, but I'm 100% certain that's where it's going. Would people get upset with Wizards of the Coast if they said, you know what, you can only play the new version of D&D on our virtual tabletop. 
You bet they would. But I'm trying to put myself into the head of a Wizards of the Coast or a Hasbro executive. This is what I've seen over the last year. We revoked the OGL and everyone get up, got upset and people canceled their D&D Beyond subscription. And a lot of YouTubers got really angry for about a month. Now they're back to making videos about D&D and players are re-upping for D&D Beyond. They went right back continuing to play the same game. People in the poll even said that. They're like, I would play something else, but my players won't play anything else. There are some people that just won't play any game but D&D. And if I know this, Wizards of the Coast knows it. More than ever, I really think there's going to be a bifurcation of the hobby. Just like there's miniature wargaming and Games Workshop. And it's totally separate audience. It's going to be role-playing games and Dungeons and Dragons. And there is going to be a dividing line. There's going to be a curtain there, a walled garden. And the people who play Dungeons and Dragons won't even know that this even exists. That is the world that Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro are striving to create. And I can't see any reason why it wouldn't work unless they just can't capture with that VTT how it feels to play a game of D&D. Right now, they're stuck between these two worlds and they're going to have to figure that out if they're going to be successful. But that's what I think. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Also below, you can get extra content and support the channel on Patreon, get my game Deathbringer at DriveThruRPG, and be on the lookout for my new campaign, The Lost City, coming in just a couple weeks. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon. May all your rolls be 20. So Deathbringer, are you excited about the D&D VTT? Does it allow me to skin Tabaxi and turn them into useful boots and cloaks? I'm gonna say no. I doubt the devs have thought of that. Then no. But I am interested on clicking on more dungeon craft.